key aspect of last week's one of the last six chapters is the the lack of reliability on occasion of witness testimony. I will tell you just from, from my own experience, uh, there, I had an opportunity to testify in a case and the suspect that we saw committing a crime was it was on Halloween, Halloween night, and the suspect was all wearing a costume. We, uh, we observed a crime, then the suspect later left before we realized the crime occurred, and then was later arrested. So we only saw the suspect in costume later, and then now that's why months later, uh, later is arrested by somebody else. And you know, later that, like about a week later, is arrested by somebody else. So obviously, that what he looks like in costume is different than what the what the suspect looked like in court. I wasn't there when he was arrested. I was only there when he committed this crime that we later figured out was a crime. While dressed as was he, yeah, he was dressed as He Man, and his buddy was dressed as uh, Mario or Mario or Luigi. You know, one of those. Like they they just didn't look the same, and um, they ended up. Like really, really hurting a, a developmentally disabled kid. It turned out they, they they claimed it was a medical emergency. They claimed to be helping him, but it turned out it was actually they were the one that caused it. So they're arrested later. And when I went to to go testify, one of the very first questions was, "Can you look around the room and tell us who it is that uh, that you saw committing this crime?" What? I don't know. I mean, I guess it's probably that guy sitting right in front of the uh, right behind that defendant sign. That's my guess, but as an investigator, I couldn't, I couldn't testify definitively. As an eyewitness, I'm not going to lie and say that's definitely the guy that I saw. So if there's other, you know, the other investigators that, that arrested later have additional evidence that point to this being the person, and that, that's why they arrested them. We have to introduce that as evidence because I'm not going to sit there and, and perjure myself as an investigator to say that's absolutely the person I saw just because they're sitting at the defendant's table. Because I'm, you know. I would just, this is a little bit of spin on eyewitness testimony not being perfect, but in this case, they look different. Uh, thank you for, for those. I want to talk a little bit about case management uh, before we get started on our lab today. So I'm going to break down kind of the, the process of receiving a case uh, when I was an investigator. So, so I'll give you a point of reference, and then we'll talk about how we're going to manage these cases. What would happen every morning, coming to work as a detective, we all have, we have an inbox. Before you receive your case in your inbox, your supervisor was going to get a case of uh, a stack of all the crimes for your specific section that occurred. So for me, uh, working in specifically mission area, mission division, and I worked the sex crime state. So any sex crime that happened in mission division is all gonna go to my supervisor. And then there's going to be some sort of case management methodology to distribute those cases to the sex detectives. In our case, there's usually two or three different sexual assault detectives. So somehow we need to divide these cases. So before we get too deep into that, let's talk about that. How, how are we going to divide? How are we going to, for case management, how are we going to divide? We have uh, me, Jack, and Jill. We're the three detectives. Detective Bell, Jack, and Joe, we, we handle every sex crime in Mission Division. So if we have nine sex crimes that occurred last night, so we have three people were arrested and six people reported sexual assaults. That's, that's nine crimes. Because we have to handle the arrests as well as the reported crimes. So we have nine crimes, three detectives. Uh, I'm sorry. What are your thoughts? How, how would you, if you're the supervisor, the detective supervisor, how are you going to divide those cases? To who? So you've got three people, Jack, Jill, and me. So who, who's going to get what? I'll get the most, I'm sorry? Oh, if, if you want, like, um, are you going to give it to the most serious to the most senior? Or are you going to give the most serious to the most junior because the most senior probably, you know, has earned their time to, to not, doesn't have to work as hard? Okay, that's an idea. Absolutely. So, you, so you're going to review each case and kind of categorize them by seriousness. That's absolutely an idea. Uh, somebody else? You just go random. That is at 100% you can go random. You got nine cases and deal it out like poker. There we go. 
What do you think takes more work? Or today, if I come to work today and I've got, so we're gonna call them bodies. When we say we have three, the same three arrests? Is that what I said? Three. We call those bodies. We have three bodies. And we call them bodies because there's literally a body in jail waiting. So we've got three bodies and six crime reports. If I'm coming to work today, of those, either a body or a report, what's going to cause more work today? The opposite, the bodies. Because what? We only have 48 hours. If we discuss charges have to be filed within 48 hours. So that report, the sexual assault report, where somebody reports, I, I was sexual assaulted last night, insert whatever details. If I don't work on that today, it's still going to be there tomorrow. If I don't work on it tomorrow, it's still be in the next week. Unfortunately, it's still going to be there next month, and not a lot's going to change. If DNA has already been collected and all your evidence is collected and frozen, like you get packaged up last hour, it's not going anywhere. The wheels of justice can move slowly, and sometimes, often, they do. However, if I don't do anything with that body, what happens? That way. So we have to work on those bodies first. So if we're talking about case management or, and you're the supervisor, now you have to consider, do I give every one of the investigators a body to handle? So we spread the wealth, one for each of them, and they can, they can handle the reports later. Do I give all three of the bodies to one detective and then let the other two work on cases? Your choice. I mean, we're, we need to think it out, though. Have a plan. Uh, so if we have random, and we have, an, uh, you know, looking at the seriousness, maybe the when you say seriousness, I imagine saying either newsworthy seriousness or it could be labor intensiveness. Like, well, this crime involves five victims. It's going to take just a lot of work, whereas this crime, same amount of seriousness, but just less work. So that it could be two different kinds of seriousness. Uh, what else? Somebody else give me an idea. What, how would you? How can we categorize these cases or, or classify, assign these cases? Volunteer. Yeah, I like that. Which True. Yeah. Most most of them. Uh, yeah. So they, we know they happened sometime last night because they weren't there when we when we left the work last night. So yeah, you can find out. You can categorize them by how urgent it is. So we've got 48 hours, and this one's we have really we only have 40 hours for this one because it's been there for eight hours. And then you said, Yeah, we all just round table and say, Oh, well, I, I like that case. Can I have it? Sure. One of the other uh, common ways to do it, very common ways to do it, is by the map. You could just, if the station's jurisdiction, I mean, make it easy as a circle, and these are all our streets. You just have streets everywhere. You could literally just, if you have three detectives, you can divide the map up and say, if it happened here, you get it. If it happened here, you get it. If it happened here, you get it. Most of my time as a detective, that's exactly how I got my case. Just look to the map, and every, every part of that map has a little sector. And if it happened in one of my sectors, that I was assigned, you know, Jack has this part of the map, Jill has this part of the map, and I got that part of the map. And if you come to work and those nine, those nine cases all happen here, it's gonna be a rough day for you. You think Jack's gonna say, I'll, I'll take six of those, don't worry about it. You just got yourself nine cases, six cases and three bodies. Tomorrow, maybe Jill has the same thing. So it's just lucky to draw that way. What you can do to mitigate that, but you can mitigate that is maybe the sectors aren't necessarily the equal size. Maybe you have a sector that has more crime than, than others, so kind of more service area, same amount of crime. You do that too. So now, moving on from the actual uh, case assignments. Once those cases are assigned, we kind of want to lump those into can I work these or can't I? The bias? You absolutely, you have to, right? And somebody, somebody has, there's so much evidence that somebody got arrested. So we don't have to worry about like, oh, does it really look like a good workable case? Outside of sexual assault, let's, let's use an example from, uh, we'll, we'll talk about like auto, auto-related crimes. Car, 
So we have car break-ins and then we have car uh, theft from a car. One where like the door is locked, literally broke a window or pried open the door and took stuff out of the car. And then sometimes people just forget their stuff and forget to lock the door, right? A little bit less of a crime, but still a crime. It's still illegal to go into somebody's car that's unlocked and take, uh, take the book back. So if the door, you come out, the, you come out the, the house and you realize the door is ajar and somebody took your book back. Okay, we'll see you. Uh, no fingerprints and there's no no physical evidence and no cameras. How are you going to solve that case? If that case was assigned to you, or you're the victim, either one, how would you go about solving that case? No video, no fingerprints, there's no damage to the car because it was left unlocked and just one item missing. No witnesses. First thing I would do is talk to the victim and say, okay, what was the one thing that was stolen? Like, do you know of any like like personally that would have wanted that or I will give you the answer. The one item that was stolen was a one hundred dollar bill that I accidentally left on the uh, the passengers. Mm -hmm. I live in the I live in the middle of nowhere. Nobody no, I have no neighbors and I have no cameras. So you can't really do that? I mean Anybody, anybody have any ideas? Am I making, is, is the case a difficult one? Is there anybody that would want a hundred dollar bill? Can we narrow down our suspect to the, the, the only person that we know that wants a hundred dollar bill? Her buddy. That is, I think, I think, you know, I've described a fairly impossible case to solve. Am I, unless somebody has, I mean, if you're a superstar detective, then, then help me out. But I think, I think it's a fairly difficult case to solve. Sure, sure. You, you could. Um, every time you suggest something like that, I'm going to take it away from you, though, just to make it an impossible case. So let's say it was on the same end and they were, uh, they were socks only, no snow. Like you, there are just cases that can't be solved. Is the point I'm trying to make. You can search for Maybe they shed some DNA. I don't know what agency you're an investigator for, but if you have the money to check for DNA on a theft from motor vehicle, then you are in a fairly crime free zone. In my jurisdiction that I work, there is no DNA being pulled on crimes like that. So we categorize that as that's a fairly unsolvable crime. So it's unsolvable for some for really specific reasons. So we didn't just look at that and be like, that's hard. We looked at it and said, well, okay, first thing we thought well, that I told you there's no cameras. So that means you asked yourself, are there any cameras? And then I told you there's no witnesses. That means you asked. Were there any witnesses? You looked at the report. You was there? I told you there wasn't any. Uh, there weren't any fingerprints. That means you, when you looked at that, you had this mental checklist. Like I'm like, okay, what about this? What about this? And once you went down that checklist, you realized I don't have any of that. We're going to categorize that as a fairly unsolvable crime. It's unfortunate, but we just don't have any what we're going to call follow-ups. The follow-ups are what we're going to consider when trying to solve these crimes. We're going to want to know, can I do a follow-up and see if there's any witnesses? Can I do a follow-up see if there's any shoe prints? Can I send a crime scene uh, technician to see if there's any fingerprints? Can I go do a follow-up and, and check with the neighbors? Maybe they have cameras. These are all different. If you have something to follow up on, you're going to categorize that as, okay, this is a workable case. The we'll keep transitioning back though, it's like a, a sexual assault. It's going to be very difficult for you, for that as an investigator for you to check ever not be able to check any follow-up box. Something in a sexual assault is going to be worthy of a follow-up. So in the jurisdiction I work, we call them category one, category two. Category ones meant you had something you can do, some sort of follow-up. There's a video. There's a, there's some DNA. There's a witness I can interview. There's a victim that I can interview that has some information that's, that's, that's worthwhile. Those are going to go in a certain pile. Those are going to go in my workable pile. But then we have our category twos, cat twos. Those are just kind of going to get filed in some jurisdictions. Like what else? Like like what I like I asked you almost literally. What else are you going to do? 
unfortunately, in those situations, if you don't know who broke into your car, or in this case, stole from your car, neither do I. As, a, as an investigator, you're not magic. You have the you have access to tools, but if you're out of tools, there's nothing else. You're not just going to hold on to this case and hope for uh, hope for a miracle. You're just going to close it out. There's, there's no follow-up. And that's the term I want you guys to remember is the, these updates, these, the follow-ups. So let's talk about this checklist that we're going to create in our head. We're not just creating our head, we're going to have a checklist. So. Um, well, we'll stick with sexual assault for these. This is an example. So regardless of the, we know we have follow-up with those three bodies, right? The three, the three in custody, because you at least go talk to the suspect. Uh, they were arrested for a reason. The patrol officers thought there was enough evidence. So we know there's follow-up there. So we describe those. So six reports that I said that are coming across the desk. Um, I'm going to say it'll be... Okay, well, we're just going to call it a uh, standard. It'll be a, a male female sexual assault on a date. That'll be our, our scenario, and we'll plug in without too much graphic detail from there. Um, Melina, I'll go with you. What's, the, what's the, one of the first questions you want to ask in that checklist, in that crime that we talked about? What do you want to know in that case to figure out if you want it, if it's, if it's solvable? Any witnesses? That's great. So we said it was a, uh, I said it was a, a, like a, a date sexual assault. So, so maybe there are, maybe there are witnesses to, where, where would they be witnesses? Because, because we've already discussed in this class that usually those types of crimes are fairly private in nature, location wise, a little difficult, but we, there are witnesses. How, how do we get witnesses to a fairly private occurrence? Do they have to be, do they have to be in the bedroom at the same time? What can, what evidentiary, what would have evidentiary value that witnesses could see at the bar? There we go. 100%. If somebody was at a bar previously or on the date previously and, and put something in, in a drink, then bingo. That's great. And then uh, you say something. See somebody leaving the house. Leave, leaving the house. Oh, yeah. Afterwards, both arriving or leaving. Yeah. Roommates. They're not in the room at the time when it happened, but they... They saw the person. Noises? Do they not they don't have to see? Witnesses can be auditory. Neighbors can hear things. Neighbors can see somebody arriving. So yeah, exactly. Witnesses. So why why do we care if somebody saw them arriving? If we if they were in the bedroom, they didn't see the crime. Why do we care if we saw somebody arrive? Okay. Based on the you know, you so know. like a time frame. Then. Yeah, yeah. Time. exactly. Um, Zoe, in this case, did I did I tell you who the suspect was? So we don't we don't know. As investigators, we don't know who the suspect is. So who does? Victim? Maybe those witnesses. That's that's why it's important to talk to the witnesses because you literally don't know who your suspect is, but somebody does. So it may not be the necessarily the behaviors that the witness can provide, but just the mere identity. You could go and talk to somebody who saw them come and go or saw them at the bar and say, okay, well, what do they look like? Now we can nail down who they are. Remember, we still need to figure out who they are, perhaps. If it's a date, the, uh, the survivor is probably going to have some, some good information, some good follow-up information for you. And as a, as a survivor or victim of this crime, if they are a witness. When it comes to court, regardless of being a victim of a crime, you're still going to testify as a witness if you get called to the stand. So they are your best witness. So your first call is probably going to be to that uh, to that survivor to find out what what happened. The, the report is going to have some information. We're going to want to follow up on that. So in that scenario, you, you you're going to have automatically it looks like we have a category one because we're we're going to be able to follow up on on witnesses and the victim. Uh, let's see. Jason, what else would you, if, if now that you got that case, uh, you said that the you have a sexual assault case, it was a, a date situation. What what other questions would you want to ask yourself as far as finding evidence or uh, uh, or follow up options? I mean, were there any 
cameras or anything around. Like the time, not the time that it occurred, but basically maybe beforehand, if we had that time frame when they arrived at the house, are there any cameras showing like where they were beforehand as well? And, more of the story, would you say? Sure. Yeah, you can. You, you always want a more universal picture of of the, the story, more than just what the uh, the eyewitnesses can can provide. So, with that in mind, where where are you going to start looking for cameras? If, if you're the investigator, what, what what are some some camera options you have? So we have so previous to where they were, so perhaps restaurants, bars, things like that, where they where they previous work, and I, like residential cameras sound like when when they arrived. Okay. What are your thoughts? Any other places you would start looking for cameras? I don't know. <clears throat> um, how do the ten block radius? Like a 10 buck raise of like the, the residents? Like, yeah, like around. He just stopped by a gas station beforehand. Another business okay. separate, yeah. Uh, the other options, depending on, on the jurisdiction, the whether rural or, or urban jurisdiction, we have uh, traffic cameras, red, red light cameras. We have uh, some jurisdictions have little public cameras, just pole cameras that, that are available. Uh, with the proliferation of ring cameras, doorbell cameras, those are huge. A lot of burglaries are getting solved with the use of that. Uh, they're just, they're just, as they say, there are cameras everywhere, uh, and just need to kind of sometimes think outside the box and think, well, where am I going to look to get this this uh, footage? And the idea of ten block radius, you can absolutely canvas. Um, Will be twenty block views a lot or twenty? I I, I think this goes back to the significance of the crime that she was describing. If you have a very significant crime, your resources are going to be more available. Mm -hmm. If you have a uh, well, in this case, it, it's very hard. I, I, I wouldn't categorize any of these sexual assaults as a minor crime, uh, but you're going, you're going to have to categorize that. You're going to have to do your own case management. If you have those nine, if all nine happen in your sector, you're going to have to categorize your crime and prioritize your cases at some point. You're going to prioritize them by uh, how, what can I work? Can I get this off my plate faster? I, I know who this suspect is. Can I just go arrest them and file this case? Or I, I know there's not enough evidence that this case is just unfortunately never going to go anywhere. He said, she said, no witnesses. I'll, I'll do my due diligence. I'll investigate as hard as I can. I'll give it to the district attorney, but I suspect it's probably going to be rejected in this case. And I can get that off, off my case load as well. Those are those are options as far as managing your own cases. Because we talk, when we talk about case management, we talked about supervisor assigning. It's more case assignment than case management. As an investigator, you're going to have to prioritize your own cases. And, and those are some of the ways you can do that. And if you have a case that's significant to you, then yeah, you're going to put some on the back burner and then do a 20, 20 block. You may have to reach out to other resources. Maybe other investigators can help you. You're, you know, you're not an island. Hopefully, if you're working in an area that has resources for you to use, you can always use uh, just other law enforcement employees. Depending, again, you can't go to the well too often. You can't, you, every case, you can't do 20, 20 blocks and, and keep pulling people to help you because you can't cry wolf. But it, it happens. Um, I've, I've done it. I've pulled in resources from all over the city for, for a significant case saying, hey, we, we, we need this, uh, we need 50 people to, to work this because it's a very specific, significant case. And because I only ask one time, I was able to get those resources. Uh, going from there, I want to mix it up just a little bit. I know we said that very rarely is there uh, a case in, in today's climate of an unseen sexual assault suspect. We said that very rarely, it's just not happening too often where people are just jumping out of the bushes to, to commit these assaults. However, I'm going to present that scenario to you for, for discussion purposes. We will give that scenario some, some sort of assault. It doesn't have to be sexual. We'll, we'll say uh, uh, robbery. This will be a robbery. Guy jumps out of the bushes and robs you and then runs away. There are witnesses. Do we know who he, in this story? We don't know who he is. How are we going to find out? We said that we check on cameras. No cameras, but you saw him and the witnesses saw him. How can we go about getting, we don't have any pictures of him. How do we get pictures of, of somebody that we, we've only seen, but don't have any photographic evidence of to the public or to the investigators? Sure, you can describe it. So I can write down, okay, he has blonde hair and I, uh, look for a guy with blonde hair, look for a guy who's about six foot, 
look for a guy with a, a scar on his forehead, uh, look for a guy who only had one eyebrow, things like that. Like just, I could write down a list. That's an idea. Sure, yeah. We, it, with, with, depend, again, depending on the jurisdiction, there are, you can have access to somebody who can draw a picture, just, just a kind of like you've seen on TV. I've done that many times where uh, in, in those in those sex crimes that hey I, I I don't know his name but but I know it this so you can have a, an artist come in and we had and our agency had artists on staff or at least on contract I don't know if they're city employees or not but they at least under contract to come in and interview they're skilled at interviewing the the witness and doing a sketch and there's a very specific process that I'm not necessarily privy to how they do it because you know sometimes they're only drawing a portion of the face. And okay, now they're not drawing an entire face and say, okay, now fix the forehead. They're okay, well, okay, let's talk about the hair and they draw the hair. Okay, now let's talk about the forehead. Let's and they draw the forehead. Tell me about the nose, and then they go about it. So it's a very interesting process. Yes, ma'am. Actually, I forgot what the nose. Oh, sounded like a good one too. It was a good one. <laughs> so we see that. Oh, wait, yes. oh Sorry. yes. <laughs> so so the thing he had, he gave you the information on the suspect. So can you, can't you use like old like topography like um uh mugshot? Can you mugshot like say, oh I, I remember this scar from this one person? That boy, I can pull a picture out and see if it's a person or not. It yeah, it that is possible. Mm -hmm. I I don't know if I would categorize that in the, the realm of probability mm -hmm. because uh at least in my position. It wasn't probable because the that the sheer number of, of folks that are arrested, it, we just didn't have access, memory access or, or, or technology access. Now, if we had, if we could find somebody who looks similar, then we'd have software that could pull up as many of those photos that were similar, mm -hmm. but it wouldn't be necessarily as uh, as much as like a scar on the forehead to be, you know, facial recognition, race, and by race, usually more like skin tone than race, you know, because uh, the photo, the photo's not looking at it and saying, okay, this person's a Hispanic or Asian. Yeah. The photo's just looking at skin tone and, and, and matching that, or excuse me, the, the software. Uh, but that does bring me to something else that is a very good, uh, very applicable what you're saying. So I may not know everybody who has a scar on their forehead, or I may not know that everybody, that, when the, the person that robbed you had a tattoo that said, uh, Foo Fighters Forever. Well, that's a pretty key piece of information. I don't know who that is. But having a that tattoo that says Foo Fighters Forever, I bet somebody's seen that. That's really distinct. And when police officers are out in the field and they're interviewing people, they stop somebody for a ticket, don't give them a ticket, or they stop them for suspicious activity, they have field interview cards that they will write down, hey, I had contact with this guy. I thought, I thought it was a little weird that he was in the back of this, uh, he was in the back of Coles at, at two in the morning, but I don't have any evidence to arrest him. I still think it's a little weird. So I think I'm gonna write down that I had contact with him and I'm gonna write down, hey, this guy was buying coals. Maybe later, if somebody else sees him buying coals, you want to check. So you can write his name, date of birth, his address, his nicknames, who he hangs out with, where he, where he works. What is, I think I said nicknames already. Nick, but also, you're also gonna write down, oh, guy has a, this guy, Michael Jones, has a scar on his forehead and he has a tattoo that says Foo Fighters Forever on his right arm. And then somebody, some sort of analyst is going to enter that into a computer. And then you get a case where this guy got robbed by a guy he doesn't know. In fact, the guy had a mask on before COVID, before masks were cool. But he didn't have a, he was wearing a, a tank top and he saw Foo Fighters Forever. I bet there's not too many people that have that tattoo. So you just plug that in the computer. Hey, I wonder who's got tattoos that say Foo Fighters Forever. And boom, Michael Jones pops up. Fuck up. You got it. So it's similar to what you're saying, but not necessarily, necessarily with, with photos. But there are the scars, marks, and tattoos that are going to be documented in these field interview cards. And those are the tools that you can use to, to search through if you have some sort of identifiable information on your suspect, but your suspect is not identified. Hopefully, you can use them to identify your suspect. Now, take away the mask part of that. What we can do now that we, if, we're, if you get robbed without a mask, you saw the guy's face, you don't know, you never seen him before in your life, but you saw the, the Foo Fighters Forever tattoo. As an investigator, you pull up, you type that in. There's only really only one, you only have one guy in, in your area 
that has a Foo Fighters for every tattoo, what are you going to do with that information? I'm sorry? Call a name for a Sure, you can absolutely. Let's call whatever I call them, Michael Jones. Mike, you can call Michael Jones. Hey, you mind coming on down? Let me highlight you for a minute. Absolutely. Yeah. What about our victim? What are we going to do with our victim with this information? We, so now we have a picture of Michael Jones. Michael Jones says, you know what? I'm all set. I don't really feel like talking to the police. Alina, tell me more about that. Um, you get Absolutely, you could do a photo lineup. Photo lineup has color and options. You can give them a piece of paper with six photos on it. These all being photos. And say, anybody on this paper look familiar? You know that the guy you think it might be is on that piece of paper. Are you going to tell them which one you put Michael Jones in? No. Why not? Because you make them think, oh, he knows who it is. I'm going to go with him. The first, the first pressure. Exactly. You don't tell you don't tell them which one you think it is. In fact, you're probably not going to because there's only one person that's that Foo Fighters Forever tattoo. So you're not going to put a picture up there where he can see the tattoo either. You're just going to show six pictures. If Michael, shoot, what was it? Michael Jones, right? Yeah. We're gonna put Michael Jones here. Michael Jones is a white guy. That's Michael Jones. There we go. So Michael Jones, well, actually, I'm strike that he's not a white guy. He's a red guy. Michael Jones has red skin. And then you're gonna find, obviously you gotta find five other people to put in this lineup. So hypothetically, one of the descriptions was, he wasn't wearing a mask, he had red skin, and he had Foo Fighters Forever tattoo. That's your description. So when you make your lineup like this, you put Michael Jones, in this case you put Michael Jones in number two, because you think it's him, because you found a picture of the Foo Fighters tattoo, and you're like, oh shoot, look at that. He has red skin, just like the guy who described. I think this guy may be our guy. So let's put them in a the lineup here with five other people that have green skin. Michael Jones has red skin. We put in a picture with five other, or I'll be straight with a picture of uh, five other people they have green skin. Are we good there? Why not? Why? Make sure they're really in the what if we're wrong? So I agree with you. So what if we're wrong? We we think there's only one guy that has a Foo Fighters Forever tattoo and he has red skin, and we're like, this is our guy. And we have put him with the red skin up there, and then we have uh, five other green skin people. And it comes to find out that there's another guy with red skin and, and a Foo Fighters Forever tattoo. Even if there's another guy, even if this doesn't look like our guy, which one do you think he's gonna pick? He's gonna pick the only one that has the descriptors that he gave. He said, it's a, it's a male with red skin. You only got one option there, then that's our guy. That's what he's gonna, and now, now you put a case on. So what you're gonna wanna do, well, how do we solve that? How do we fix that? How do we fix this? There you go, yeah. Make them all red skin. Or make them all green skin or you know, whatever. Make them all with long hair. If you can find five other guys with tattoos, or excuse me, you have scars on their forehead, do that. If only one of if, if your suspect is wearing glasses and there's only one picture of one guy in there wearing glasses, which one's getting picked? Okay, so make them all wearing glasses. If your suspect is white and you put a white guy, uh, two Hispanic guys and three black guys, or if your suspect is male and you put one male and four and five females, like it's it's just not going to work. You have to have the similarities that you're saying for the validity. That's how you know that you're more close to getting the correct suspect. The true name of this uh, investigative tool is a photographic lineup. Sometimes you'll hear that's called a six pack. However, 
there are a couple different ways we can present these. We can do it like this. But studies have shown that perhaps, and then and there's some some controversy and some leanings both ways. This is the way it's all kind of like this is the way it's always been done. But there are studies out there that are in, uh, exploring the idea that this is not the best way to present six photographs because of some, like we talked about last week, the, the lack of witness identification. The witnesses are wrong sometimes. Sometimes, so I, when I said it was a piece of paper with, uh, with six, it's literally just that. You just pull it, it's an eight, by, eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper with six photographs on it. The other option is, or anybody have, what, can we think of another option before I get to you? We do have an in-person, I'm going to touch on that in a second, but photographs specifically, can we think of a better way to do, or a different, not even better, I'm not going to say one was better than the other, I'm saying that it's, it's being looked at. So this is all six at the same time, what's the other option? Separately, one at a time, being explored. The idea that I'm going to hand you, I have a stack of six photographs, I'm going to hand you one photograph, is this the, is this the person? No? Put that away. What about this one? Is this the person? No? Okay. And then you go through it. What are the, what, are, what do you think that some advantages those are? I would say so, yeah. Because personally, just, just knowing myself and my psyche and the way my brain works, if I look at those six pictures, I can't look at all six of them at the same time. I would have to look at them one at a time. And if I'm overwhelmed, nervous, I just got robbed, and now I'm talking about a very stressful situation. I'm in a police station. I've never been in a police station before. I'm in the back of the police station you know, with the detectives. I'm intimidated, and then boom, now I'm looking at six photographs of people that I've probably never seen. My brain is kind of, my short circuit a little bit. You know, just, just a lot going on. Whereas maybe one at a time gives me an opportunity to just, okay. I mean, look at this. Okay, this, this isn't the person. Okay, I, I know that. I don't have to look at six, but I know this isn't. And then when I look at it, I look at it. Yeah, that's them. Yeah, one at a time. So interesting concept, not necessarily widespread yet, but it is a, uh, it's being explored, like I said. So we can't really call that second way a six pack, really. Uh, and again, that, that's not something you'll need for, for the exam, just, just a practical knowledge. Uh, but we, we talk about an in-person lineup as well. So in that scenario, guy jumps out of the bushes, runs, uh, and we think we know who it is. We're not sure. And we can put them, uh, we can, can we do a, a, an in-person lineup for that? I would submit to you that we cannot. Why, there's a one very significant aspect of that that's going to prevent us from being able to do a, an in-person lineup. What is it? If you don't know, how can you find him? So how are we going to get Michael Jones to stand in the lineup if we don't even know who Michael Jones is? One, we have to know who he is. Two, doesn't he have to already be in jail? Because we can't just snatch him up. I can't just go kidnap him and put him in the lineup. The only time we have we have lineup that, that's going to be possible, I should say the only time, but the very rare opportunity that's going to, to present itself is that the person you suspect of the crime has to already be in custody for something. Maybe that crime, maybe something unrelated. You find out, oh, oh shoot, they're, they're already in jail for this other thing. We can do a, a lineup that way. Those are a lot more rare. I know you see them all the time on TV. You hardly ever see this on TV, right? This happens every day. Those photo lineups, I'm sorry, those in-person lineups, I'll tell you, in 22 years, I never saw one. I'm not saying it never happened. I just didn't have an occasion to do it. It just... It's a, it's a, for, for one, logistically, it's, it's a, it's tough to just to get it all put together. You gotta, it's easy to print out six photos. It's difficult to get all those people lined up. So, although you see it on TV all the time, awfully, awfully rare. We talked about it real briefly, but I want to touch on it because it's in list is uh, DNA evidence. If, if your case has evidence, specifically DNA or any kind of evidence, then you have, now you have follow-up. The idea that if uh, 
somebody broke into the car and left a drop of blood. You can't categorize that as a, you know, as a category two or unsolvable because you at least have to check in on that blood. You got to do something. That is follow up in and of itself. The, the fact that evidence exists. I know I'm speaking specifically of, of DNA, but any evidence. If, if you have a shooting and there's a, a, a piece of breast, that is evidence. We, we, can, we can look at that. We can, it doesn't even have to be trace evidence. It doesn't have to be physical evidence that you're going to run uh, forensics on. Outside of forensics, what do we, or outside of like fingerprints and DNA, why do we care about that breast? Sure. I mean, uh, I, I, I correct myself when I said forensic because that the gun, gun analysis may be a little bit of forensic, but also, I mean, maybe it's a really obscure round and they're only sold in one part of the country and that's going to be a clue for you to begin your follow ups. So that just any, any evidence that's attached to that, that crime report is going to necessitate you following up in some way on that evidence. And just one, one thing to, to touch on the witness identification. The victim is going to be uh, able to identify the suspect. It's going to bolster your ability to follow up. Going back to the gentleman uh, when Michael Jones had the mask on. In this case, no, uh, no sleeveless shirt, no Foo Fighters Forever tattoo. All we know is that uh, we have a, a male white uh, wearing a black, all black, that robbed him. Never, and he was wearing a ski mask. All he saw was that his hands were white. We're not even really sure if he's if he's white or just light skinned something else. If we can, if we somehow suspect somebody of committing a crime, if down the street he commit, we have somebody who committed a crime without the ski mask and they're arrested. We're like, well, that's a male, that's a male white. He may committed a robbery a block away about 10 minutes later. And then we bring that guy and say, hey, is this the guy that robbed you? Can you identify? No, it's gonna be very, very difficult. So now we have, now we're presented with a case that's gonna have a lot less follow-up despite the fact that he was seen. So the ability to identify the, the suspect is gonna also be under checklist for follow-up. Any questions on what we discussed today? Yes. Uh, most common are two databases. One, the database of all the other booking photos. I'm sure you can find five people. If you have a suspected criminal that looks that looks like this, you can probably find five other people that have been booked sometime in the last 10 years that kind of look like that. So you take their booking photos or driver's license. Just open up the DMV website, or not the DMV website, the DMV database that, that you, you have uh, special access to. Uh, and then just, if you, because sometimes your suspect has never been arrested before. You gotta be arrested for the first time sometime. So you're gonna go and, and get your suspect photo out of, the, uh, out of the DMV website, or DMV database, and then you're just gonna find five other people in the DMV database. You type in your parameters, it's gonna pull up. Usually the software that we used was uh, you didn't have to necessarily type in the parameters. You would upload one photo and you would just find a hundred photos that look kind of like it. You just pick five because it's software. It's not going to be perfect. Uh, again, and it's going to look at some things that not always, uh, that are always going to be perfect. So maybe it's looking at the hair color, the skin hue, and, and the facial features. But one guy's got super long hair and their suspect doesn't. So you can't use that one. You're gonna, that's where you're going to get your photos. Any other questions? 